too quick. Please, you guys, just was way too quick. Amen. Gave us a sip and walked out the room. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Marcus, come take this bad boy away. Amen. Oh, thank you so much. If you give a prophet a drink of water in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward.
Deuteronomy 15 verse 1 to 4. Matthew 27 verse 15 to 17. And Joshua chapter 6 verse 1 and 2. We are expecting towards the end of this service a real significant outbreak. A real significant outbreak of power and authority. That's my expectation. It's going to happen because of what God is going to do for us and for you. At the end of every seven years, you shall make a release. This is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lends ought to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not add interest to his neighbor nor his brother because it is called the Lord's release. For a foreigner you may exact it again but that which is yours and of your brothers your hand shall release it. This is the Lord's release. Save when there shall be no poor among you for the Lord shall greatly bless you. In other words, there comes a time when God's going to bless in such a way that there will be no poor among you. I said there will be no poor among you. Because the Lord gives you for an inheritance to possess it. Amen. Jericho, uh, um, Matthew, Matthew. Now at the feast of Passover, the governor or the procurator over Israel was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they have taken a notable prisoner named Barabbas. Therefore, when they gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom would that you would I have release to you? Barabbas or Jesus? Wheat or tares? Good or evil? Right? and wrong night and day what do you want me to release unto you and they said unanimously release unto us Barabbas we now in the book of Joshua 6 verse 1 now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went in, none came out. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into your hand, number one, Jericho. I have given into your hand the king of Jericho. And I have given into your hand the mighty men of valor of Jericho. Don't be satisfied until you get all three. I have given you three things. I have given you the city, Jericho. I have given you the king of Jericho. And I have given you the mighty men, mighty men of Jericho. And verse 22 of Joshua 6. Joshua said unto the two men that spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she has. 
as you swear unto her. And the men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers. And all that she had, they brought, brought out all her kindreds and brought them into the camp of Israel. Everyone say release. release. Father, please help me in Jesus' name. Sisters and brothers, all actions have outcomes, both those deliberate and those that are not. Inaction is an action. Indecision is a decision. Non-movement is a movement. And most of the time, inaction or lack of action, action, decisions, a lot of the time are made or decisions are not made based on several things. And that these things sometimes are a direct result of a previous times uh, event that inhibited and prohibited you to make a decision. It has to do with sometimes a lack of self-confidence. Might be a low self-esteem. And all actions and outcomes, all actions and a lack of action produces outcomes that may not be desirable in your life. And so there are some things that you can change, those you change. Stay away from pizza after 10 o'clock at night. Amen. No matter how the dominoes are falling. Amen. Because you will enlarge your territory. And so that brings us to a very precarious place in a discussion that would need uh, lengthy probing, and that is to do with choices and decisions. Because there are some decisions that are made for us that affect and impact our lives, and the decisions made on our behalf many times we have no control over. If you are a young, is this your son? Is that your son? He's somebody's son. <laughs> Parents may make a decision to go and live in Los Angeles. And he doesn't want to go to Los Angeles. But somebody has made a decision and a choice that you, you can't have anything to say about, at least at this age. So pack your bags and go to L.A. And that can impact your entire life and your future. A government can make a ruling, their decision, a handful of people, that can affect entire communities. Bishop can say, yeah, the Lord spoke to him to do one service a week on a Friday. Well, nobody's going to argue with Bishop, at least visibly. <laughs> but most people know his track record and would trust and rely that that is a word from the Lord because God might be visiting Fridays. Amen. And that will change the way you do weekends. But there are decisions that we have to make as individuals that sometimes the choices and decisions we make are outside of our power. Uh, be because 
uh, a generation before us impacted the way we think. And so I'll use myself as an example. Uh, when I was about nine years old, ten-ish, uh, feels like an auction now, maybe 11 or 12, do I hear 13, 14, 15, 16, 17? About 12 years old, I had an aunt, my mom's sister, who's older than my mom. She just told me one day, we're just kids playing. We were poor people, really, and poor is relative. Because I said to a Nigerian brother, I saw my parents leave me in a certain place and drive away in their car. He said, you guys had a car, you were poor, you had a car. And so in that world, we were poor, but we had a car. But there were people that were poorer that had no car. And so in our relative area where we were poor, there was no deodorant. And so my mom's sister told me one day, she said, oh, Judy, you stink, you smell so bad. I'm so ashamed of you, you stink. And that hurt me so deeply cut me so deeply, so much so now, my behavior from when I started working, that statement has affected and developed a behavior. So I overspray. <laughs> I overspray. I have a certain spray, a cologne, I spray all my shoes, my running shoes, my socks, all my undies. Everything is sprayed. My suitcase, I spray everything. I go through a bottle of cologne in two or three weeks. Because one statement that hurt me deeply produced a behavior. That behavior now has been passed on because my sons see me doing that. They don't know why I overspray, but they overspray too. It affects the way one thinks. And sometimes that's not always a good thing, especially when we're dealing with church and theology. Stay with me a little. There is a group that prays in West Africa. Uh, their leader started praying in a wetland swamp area by himself because he prayed loud and very aggressive. And uh, he would go there and use a white handkerchief as he was praying. And uh, he was using that white handkerchief and as his prayers became impactful and began to draw others to the swamp area where he was praying because that's where he said he would meet God. But the truth is that he had no building. There was no other place to pray. That's why he went there. And others joined him there and they saw him with a white handkerchief and they came with a white handkerchief but he used a white handkerchief to keep mosquitoes out his face. <laughs> but they didn't know that he was keeping mosquitoes out his face. They thought that that, that was part of where the power comes from. <laughs> and so when they came with white handkerchiefs to pray, he thought they were using white handkerchiefs to keep mosquitoes out their face. And it was never corrected until years later when people were being given white handkerchiefs coming into the prayer meetings in their beautiful church that they'd built for prayer. And they were told, you cannot be in the prayer meeting without a white handkerchief because that's where the power is. <laughs> and so sometimes an informal decision can create a permanent culture that can be destructive or even helpful. Amen. And so this come, leads me now to segue into prayer. Uh, God does not answer all prayer. God answers prayer. But God does not answer all prayer. Mary comes and is interceding and worshiping and she says, oh Lord. And he says, what can I do for you? He said, when you get into your kingdom, let my sons be number one and two. And Jesus said, now baby, you sweat but uh, I can't answer that prayer because that level of prayer is decided by God's hierarchical system beyond the heavens. Amen. He turned to them. He said, uh, are you guys able to carry my cross? 
and are you able to drink this cup? And they said, we are. Are you willing to be baptized in my baptism? They said, we are. And he said, that you will. But to answer that prayer, I can't answer that prayer. Amen. I asked the Lord three times to take the stone in my flesh away from me. And God said, Paul, I'm not answering your prayer. Just learn to live with it. I'll give you grace to compensate for that thorn in the flesh because of the abundance of revelation in your life, lest you be exalted. And so then I've learned the greatest deliverance is being delivered from the fact that I know I may never be delivered. That's the greatest deliverance. When you know that this prayer is not going to be answered. Everyone say, so help me God. And so it is, it is at this level where it is essential to sin brothers that the believer is grown up and mature. Where we don't sulk and pout and throw our toys out the cot. Rolex, watch, Mercedes, Benz, Bentley, because we are mad because God didn't answer our prayer. Oh, God didn't do something for us that we thought we should have. I mean, he was the only man in church, and now he's gone off somewhere on the midnight train to Georgia with a girl named Georgia on a roast stormy night in Georgia. And now you're mad at God because he took your M-A-N. But the natural man cannot receive the things that are of God because they are spiritually discerned and it's going to take men and women that have strong meat by reason of use having their, excess, their senses exercised there are some things that are low seat discussions that uh, should not be considered because they consume time we should be going for deeper things because we are world shapers. And so when God then deals with me, I have to then understand. Uh, I'm dealing with Jesus and Barabbas, a life and a death, a good and an evil. It's my decision and my choice. Before I make my decision, I have to investigate and inventorize my behavior because sometimes I will make the wrong choice based on my culture and not based on a spiritual act. I will function on impulse and I will not make the right decision because of the way I was raised and shaped. And so then I have to delve into the spirit because when God speaks to me, he speaks to my spirit. My spirit then translates that into my mind and my mind is shaped by circumstances and an environment that I'm raised in. And so you can say something to a Zimbabwean and something to somebody that lives and comes out of Harvard, the same thing. They'll think two opposite things. I can say prosperity, somebody gets mad because all we talk about is money. Somebody will say it's about time we dealt with this. What's the difference? The same word. The same sun has melted the wax and the same sun has hardened clay. It's just the condition of a person's heart, mind, and upbringing. Amen? And so when God deals with my mind and God deals with my spirit, I have to then calculate what is the end purpose for that. If God is saying that my grace is sufficient for you, that that you'll have grace to work and operate in time of need, we then can learn to deal with a problem child, which we have. Son was born uh, in 1993. Uh, we have four sons with a severe heart condition. He does not have a pulmonary artery. The hole in his heart cannot be closed. And so out of his aorta comes... Uh, collateral vessels that plug all over his lungs. And we were told we'd be fortunate to have him for one year, but definitely by the age of 12, he will have passed. And Bernstein, in a few months, will be 26. <clears throat> mm. 
But last year and the year before, in the course of the year, he almost passed away five times. And we're that close to, to our hearts being torn. And if that's not bad, he had a total mental breakdown when he was 18. And uh, it was so bad, he lost all of his dream waves. Couldn't remember anybody. Didn't recognize anyone. I was the first one after three months he recognized and he said, Dada because he was reduced to that of a three-year-old and had to be reconstructed and built as 24-hour nursing, has, can't even remember to go to the bathroom. And we have miracles in that church. I'm going to places where God is going crazy healing people. And we have a son at home who is in deep need. Does Jehovah Rafika exist? Oh, absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Will Bernie be healed? Oh, absolutely. If not here, there. But we are believing for a total compact miracle for his life. But until then, we want the devil and his mother-in-law to know that God is great all the time. Devil, how dare you, you, how dare you even suggest that God is unfair? How dare, amen. He knows the way that I take. Mm. And when I am tried, I know that I will come through as shining pure gold. And whatever God has forbidden, Bernie to enjoy for whatever sovereign reason somehow there's compensation for him on some place in another world amen show somebody your right hand say there's seven high fives coming amen amen don't give one don't give one just show them because if you gave it you're down to six Amen and amen. And so then dealing with issues of persecution or austerity or demonic attacks or trouble or sickness or untimely death uh, sometimes can throw a person off balance because she didn't expect it. Isn't it amazing that after you get a prophetic word directed to your life that all of hell and it's regurgitated stuff comes to hit you well that's a good sign because it means that the word is true yeah. anytime evil shows up in your life ignore it completely and say the good door has to be here somewhere it's got to be here somewhere amen anytime a Barabbas is in your world there is a resurrected Jesus ready to lift you out Oh yes, amen. The fact that tares are sown next to the wheat doesn't mean that you won't have a harvest. Amen. When the wheat is planted and tares grow up because of envy and hate, amen, what you can celebrate is the harvest is coming. Your job is to stay sane and stay alive and enjoy your harvest when it comes. Everyone say release. Uh, release. The book of Acts is a fascinating book because in that it encapsulated, encapsulates God's intention for the way the church ought to be. When Jesus comes and leaves, he doesn't leave us with too much. Uh, didn't leave us with a book, didn't leave us with any kinds of instructions. You know, it took years and years to determine uh, who's a deacon, what's a deacon, who's an elder, what's an elder, how do you function, communion, all of that. And so the Apostle Paul then is going to come and help define some of those things in his books. And so when the church begins the day of Pentecost, uh, there's 3,000 people added. And uh, they assembled using the temple, what was old, and bringing a new wine skin, new wine into an old wine skin and worshiping because there was no place to go. And at the gates of the temple, they work a miracle that was very notable a man that was uh, paralyzed all his life. He was born with an impediment. 
Peter, his ankle bones were weak and couldn't walk. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I give are thee. And raised the man. And a miraculous broke out because of this notable miracle. And Peter said, it, it is his name through power and faith in his name that has made this man whole in the presence of you all. And so Peter and John and the apostles were arrested and threatened and said, how dare you come and perform miracles outside our temple preaching this new way. And uh, they were threatened. And Paul, Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than man. For neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven, given by, under heaven given by which we must be saved. 4.12 of Acts. And then they picked them up again because they began to spread that gospel even more. And threatened them again and beat them this time. Wrote them a strong letter. And so they took that letter and put it before the Lord. 4.29 of Acts. Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants with all boldness they might speak thy word and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And after they had prayed, the Bible says the place was shaken. And the word of the Lord increased. Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira tampered with the offering and God killed them. Not because they tampered with the offering, but because they brought an impurity into the move of the Holy Spirit. And God took them out and fear came amongst the church, a reverence and a respect. And thousands of people were added to the church, including priests. Amen. And outstanding miracles that even the shadow of Peter began to heal people as he walked by. They emptied out the streets and brought them there. Peter didn't pray for my shadow, to, for his shadow to heal people. Acts 7, Acts 6, they began to raise up deacons because the Grecian widows were complaining, we, we need attention, we're not being fed. And so they appointed seven deacons, powerful men intellectuals, uh, powerful in faith and the word, and they began to serve. In Acts 7, Stephen, the most notable of the seven, alongside with Philip, who went to Samaria in Acts 8, Stephen began to preach the word, and he began, began to contest a position against the Sanhedrin. And Stephen's error was after he had won the discussion, uh, he called them stiff-necked and murderers and killers, and so they took him out of the city and killed him with stones. And they laid their garments at the feet of one called Saul. And Saul, who had an ambitious uh, political agenda to rise within the Sanhedrin political system, took that opportunity to obtain letters to arrest Christians. And when the, they heard that there was a, uh, a warrant for the arrest for the six remaining deacons, Philip raced over to Samaria with his four daughters. And when he got to Samaria, the Bible says he preached Christ unto them. And signs and wonders and miracles took all taking place all over that city. So much so that the chief witch doctor there, the Sangoma of the house, saw the power of God fall when Peter and John laid hands on people to receive the Holy Ghost. He said, I'll give you big money, Acts 8, 19, if you'll give me this gift. And Pete said, you'll perish with your money because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with your little uh, few shillings. Amen. But the word of God increased. Paul was somewhere being trained by the Holy Ghost in Arabia. And uh, this comes in Acts 9 after he's arrested on the Damascus road and uh, goes to the city of Damascus, they pray for him, scales fall off his eyes, and he makes the decision to preach immediately. But he's not ready for the kind of message that he has. So God has to send him away to, to have him detoxed from all the stuff he had and put some good stuff in him. So God put him on a kingdom uh, degree program. Four years in God's university with the HG as your chief lecturer and you'll graduate with honors with a PhD in kingdomology. Yeah, in Acts chapter number 10, because the Gentile apostle is absent, being magistrized and colonized for the kingdom of God, Peter has to go to Cornelius' house because an angel told Cornelius, go to Joppa and find Simon, he'll tell you what to do. 
and, and Simon makes up his mind because he's not supposed to visit Gentiles. But God is kind and gives him a vision with a sheet of all kinds of animals in there. And said, Pete, slay and eat. And Pete's going to argue with God. And, and God says, nothing that I have given is unclean. Just eat it, man. And as soon as he woke up, it was a knock on the door from Cornelius' household. And so Peter goes to a strange house. And while he's telling his stories and spake these words before he jumps onto circumcision, as his customers going to be, boom, the HG fell in that place. And Peter said, my goodness, these have received the HG the same way as we did in the beginning. For they heard them speak with tongues as they did. And then he said, they've got to be baptized. Amen. And they put them down in Cornelius' swimming pool. All of his household, all 100 and their servant, down in the name of the Lord. Peter came back with rejoicing. And there were some people that got mad at his decision for going to Cornelius' house and eating with people that eat pork meat and don't wash their hands and women shave their legs and da-da-da. Got so mad and Peter wasted a whole chapter explaining himself because a bunch of people hadn't grown up in their head. Acts chapter number 12, an enemy, an adversarial force is raised up. His name is Herod and he's the ninth of a lineage of Herods. And he's the Herod the terrible. And he arrested James and killed him and then arrested Peter. But while Peter was in jail, 12, 5 of the book, book of Acts, while Peter was in jail, the Bible says, and the church was in intercession making prayers for him all night at the house of Mary, whose mother, she was the mother of James who was just killed. She's the mother of the son of Zebedee. In other words, this is not a time to cry. This is a time to push. They pushed in prayer. And while they were praying, an angel came out of nowhere, kicked Peter on the shoulder and said, wake up, Peter. Put on your shoes and walk, baby. In the Old Testament, you take off your shoes. In the new one, you put them on. Have your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Because you've got places to go, people to see, money to spend, cars to drive, wives to marry, children to have. Put your hands together for what's coming. And Peter, when he comes out of jail, the Bible says the door opened. And then the scripture says, and finally, the iron gate into the city opened. In other words, the last barrier is opening now, Peter. What was holding you back? I'm opening this barrier. And Peter went to the prayer meeting. The only problem was they had somebody manning the door that hadn't given birth to anything. Rhoda. Amen. Don't have someone who hasn't birthed anything man your door. Amen. Let them have an experience of pushing something out before they are in charge of your door. And Peter had to go into hiding for a while because of that devil Herod. And Herod then goes to Caesarea Philippi and begins to address a congregation there. And the Bible says he spoke so well. His oratory presentation was second to none. And he didn't give God the glory. And so the same angel that got Peter out of jail put Herod in hell by giving him one slap at the back of his head. Slapped him so hard it was like grandmama hitting you with a skillet pan for being so stupid. <laughs> Smashed him and the worms ate him right there. But the word of God, Acts chapter 12, 24, the word of God increased and increased and increased and increased. Yes, yes, yes. In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas are joined together and they go into ministry, separated into ministry by uh, the Holy Ghost. They go to Cilicia and uh, uh, they, they travel to the known parts of the world and get to Lystra and so on, get to Galatia 
And when they get to Galatia, they sing in Kumbaya, and Paul finds Titus there, and they celebrating. They bring that whole bunch to a council meeting because a group of religious people, again, based on the upbringing and decisions that are being made, maybe well-meaning, insisted that all Gentile males be circumcised as a sign that they really are saved. And Paul was in upheaval. And he says even Peter was carried away with the dissimulation and tried to even persuade Barnabas. And I confronted them in front of all the Galatians and said, you don't do wrong because this is a work of flesh. You're moving towards legalism. And he says, we have been set free. We are. He says in Galatians that we are the children of Abraham. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Because cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So sin brothers, when kings were killed in the Old Testament, when Israel would take over, they would never cut off their head. Amen. What they would do is they would hang them on a tree because when they hung them on a tree, the curse of the land would go on the king that was cursed and the curse would be lifted off the land so that when Israel moved in, the curse now is on the one hanging on a tree and not on the land, making way for the land. Are you with me so far? And so in this particular case here, uh, Paul is teaching the Galatians that our curse hung on a tree. There's no curse against us. That curse, all those things that were written against us was hanging on a tree. The king was hung on a tree and every curse has been removed from Adam. The land is cleansed now. The pathway is opened. Blessing is free. Because Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hang on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. And if you be Christ, 3.29 of, Gent of Je Galatians, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And then he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, 5, 1 of Galatians, wherewith Christ has set you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. 5, 11 of Galatians, for brethren, we have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve ye one another. Amen, amen, amen. So when Paul comes to, from the Galatian journey, they are disputing in Jerusalem over circumcision. And after they disputed on all points over circumcision, James, the brother of Jesus, who was the leader of the church, not Peter, it was James, it was not Peter. The reason it's James, the law said, if a man marries a woman and doesn't raise up a child with that woman and dies before he raises up seed, his brother has to raise up seed for him. So James, the brother of Jesus, had to marry the bride of Christ and raise up seed for Jesus. Amen. That's why James said, this is my judgment. Why? He's the head of the household. Amen. Chapter number 15, verse 18. This is my judgment. Leave the Gentiles alone. Shout, leave us alone. Oh, yeah. Shout, leave us alone. So just so leave them alone. They mustn't offer meat to idols. They mustn't eat blood and so on and so forth. And they were so excited. Peter and Barnabas write letters uh, and they send those letters to all the churches. And they're so excited. They made up their minds. They're going to go on another missionary journey. But this time, Paul and Barnabas have a scrap over taking John Mark. Because he said, Mark is still on milk. We need meaty things. And so Barnabas chose John Mark, and you don't hear of him again. And Paul chose Silas, amen. And Paul and Silas went, the Bible says they came to Philippi. Stay with me, amen. They came to Philippi. And while they were in Philippi, going towards Philippi, they saw in a certain town a young boy that was glowing in the service. And Paul said, who is that kid? They said, oh, that's Timotheus. His mother is a Jewess. His father's a Greek. He said, I want that boy. There's something on his life. I have something that I'll have to pass on in the future. And I think I might have found my successor, my spiritual son. So he asked for permission and took Timothy 
And even though Paul fought against circumcision in 15, in 16, he has the boys circumcised. Timothy's circumcision was not a circumcision unto salvation. It was a mark for ministry. I'm going to cut you for ministry that every time you see this mark, you won't forget who you is and you won't forget who cut you and where you have to go. That mark makes you an heir of my gift. Amen. And so Paul and Silas get towards with Timothy to the city of Philippi. And a witch shows up there and starts cussing them out. These are the servants of the Most High God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, and Paul, after a while, got so ticked off, he cast out that devil. After he cast out that devil, sisters and brothers, and removed that devil, it made a number of people mad. Because as a spirit medium, she was making money for certain business people. And so the business people got mad that the devil was cast out. And so they took Paul to the police. And the police arrested Paul and they took him to the magistrate. And the magistrate heard the case and the sensitivity of the case and put Paul in jail. But before he put them there, he had them whipped. Amen. But they didn't know that beating Paul with 39 stripes, amen, that the 39 stripes were removing all of the 39 books of the Old Testament that were judging those people. 39 books moved. You're now coming into a new gospel. And they also didn't know that the whooping on Paul's back was for the healing of that area of Philippi being struck in poverty. He was being whooped for the healing for their prosperity. And when they handed him to the jailer, the jailer put them not just in jail, but in the inner prison and locked them down. Amen. Paul was trying to get into that city and couldn't get in. But look what God did. God had him whipped and put right in the womb of Philippi. Put a small seed in the womb of Philippi. And the Bible says at midnight, 1625 of the book of Acts at midnight Paul and Silas began to sing praises unto the Lord Paul why are you singing at midnight he said I heard Isaiah say in 54 verse 1 sing O barren sing O barren I'm singing at midnight to end the barrenness in Philippi and all the jailers heard them sing. And the jail began to shake and rock. And as the jail rocked and began to shake, the Bible says, all the doors were opened. I declare tonight there's a release of all the doors. Oh yes, I'm just, I'm just a young man trying to find a place to preach. And in my short years of preaching, I've seen some fascinating things. I've seen very beautiful women. That door is opened, but you can't find a husband because that door is closed. I've seen brilliant kids who have high acumen. That door is opened, but they can't get to college because they got no money. That door is closed. I've seen men that are brilliant preachers. That door is opened, but they got no place to preach. I've seen some with a driver's license. That door is opened, but they don't got a car. I've seen some that can sing so sweet, but no one will record their songs. I'm telling you, all the doors are opened. Amen. I've seen people rent a house. That door is open, but don't have money to buy a house. That door is about to be opened. Turn to your neighbor, say first high five. Say all the doors are opening. Amen. When all the doors opened, I said when all the doors opened, the jailer thought that the prisoners had escaped. Paul and Silas said, we're still here. Don't kill yourself. The jailer was touched at their integrity. And he washed their 
their stripes, invited them to his house and gave them something to eat. If sisters and brothers, the Grecian women didn't have uh, need, Paul would not, uh, Stephen would not have been raised as a deacon. And if Stephen was not raised as a deacon, Stephen would not have preached where he was killed. And if Stephen wasn't preached to where he was killed, they would not have laid their garments at the feet of one called Saul. Yes, and if they hadn't laid their garments at the one whose feet was Saul, they wouldn't have driven an appetite to kill Jews, to kill Christians, and get papers to go to Damascus. And if he wasn't on the Damascus road, he would not have had an interception from the Lord saying, why are you persecuting me? And if that voice had not spoken, he would not have been directed to Ananias in Damascus. And if he had not been in Damascus, he would not have been baptized. And scales would not have fallen off his eyes. And if the scales had not fallen off his eyes, he would not have seen the true path of the kingdom of God. And if he hadn't seen the true path of the kingdom of God, Barnabas would not have found him to look after him. But it was Barnabas that had brought him to the city of Antioch. And if he was not in Antioch, the Holy Spirit would not have said, separate Paul and Barnabas for the gospel. Yes, and if the Holy Ghost had not separated them for the gospel, Paul would not have preached to the Galatian church. And if Paul had not preached to the Galatian church, the issue of circumcision would not have been raised. And if the issue of circumcision had not been raised, there would not have been a decree that had to be spread to the Gentile churches. And if that decree to be spread to the Gentile churches was not given, Paul would have not gone to Philippi to find Timothy. And if he'd not found Timothy in Philippi, there wouldn't have been a witch to cuss out Paul. And if that witch hadn't cussed out Paul, Paul wouldn't have cut out that devil. And if Paul hadn't cast out the devil, the magistrate would not have been told by the police there's a troublemaker in town. And if they didn't put Paul in jail, Paul would not be singing at midnight with pain in his back. And if Paul hadn't sang at midnight with pain in his back, the jailer would not have said, don't kill yourself. I'm still here. And the Bible says the jailer washed his back. And if the jailer hadn't washed his stripes, would not have invited him into his house. And if the jailer had not invited Paul into his house, Paul would not have preached to him when he said, what shall I do? And if he hadn't said, what shall I do? He would not have had the church of Philippi start. And if we didn't have the book of Philippians, we could not be able to say, by grace are we saved. It is the grace of God that saves us. If we didn't have the church at Philippi, the book of Philippians would not have been written. And we couldn't say that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is God to the glory of God. Somebody say amen. If we didn't have the book of Philippians, we couldn't say, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. If we didn't have the book of Philippians, I couldn't say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So now I know that all things are working for my good. If I don't get my prayers answered now, there's a Philippian reason down the road. If I don't get away now, I know there's a redemptive plan somewhere. I know that 
if something is not working now, God is working for my good. And the Bible says that Jericho was shut up tightly, closed down. Sisters and brothers, if Paul and Silas can be released at midnight, Jericho is nothing. Jericho, you're coming down. I know you're locked up, but God says release. It's the time of God's release. It's the seventh year. We're coming for you, Jericho. We're crossing over Jordan, and we're coming to our Jericho. So fortify your walls. Put bulwarks on your walls. Strengthen your gates. God said, Jericho is mine. So by faith in God, I'm coming for my Jericho. Ready or not, give someone a high five. Say, get ready. It's time for Jericho. Jericho hour is on the way. Say, yes, Lord. I'm going to feel like pushing a little harder now. I got a feeling that this anointing service, this last day of the convocation, the angel's about to stir the water. This last day of the convocation, a loud voice is about to cry, and rivers of living water are gonna flow out of your belly. This last night of the convocation, the miracle you've been dreaming about, the breakthrough you've been waiting for, it's about to be released. I want release tonight. Shout with me, say, Father. Shout, Father. I make a demand on the heavens tonight. Release what belongs to me. Shout, Father. Release what belongs to me. I believe that tonight answering my prayer look straight at your neighbor say release that land is released release that power is coming shout release that miracle is coming shout release that teenage is coming to their senses shout release scholarship is on the way Oh, Jericho, Jericho, I'm coming for you. When they cross over, the strategy is go around Jericho one time on the first day. So they go around Jericho one time and go back to the camp. The enemy says, what are these guys doing? The next morning, they get up again. The HG said, go around Jericho one one time and so they go around Jericho one time I'm waiting for somebody to go around something and they go back to the camp have their dinner early the next morning they wake up and organize they go around Jericho the third time but the enemy doesn't know that this is going to be seven days the enemy is getting nervous now because the enemy knows God is up to something on the fourth day they go around Jericho one time on the fourth day we know there's three more days to go but the enemy is getting nervous now he's intensifying the trial he's making your life hell the kids are getting more sick the cars breaking down hospital bills increasing you think you're losing your mind but drag your carcass out of bed it's only the fifth day go around jericho the fifth time devil i'm walking by faith and not by sight the things of God are spiritually deserved. It doesn't make sense that God can give a whole city by one man walking around the city. It's now the fifth day. You know the routine now. Here we come. Don't say a word. Keep your mouth closed. Keep the promise in your heart. Keep the blessing in your spirit. Stay fixed and focused. Look towards the prize of the high calling of the marking.
Christ Jesus from getting those things that are behind. Day number six, shall I come again? Six times. Give your neighbor a high five. Say you did it six times. You're over halfway. I need the keys in my monitor. Amen. I've gone around six times. I've lived through cancer. I've lived through challenge. I've lived through lack. I lived with no car. I lived with no job. I lived with fire in my life. And devil, is this the best you can do? I know my God is able to do exceeding abundantly above. All I can ask for is if I never get another miracle, he's still God, the mighty God, the reigning God, the ruling king, the knockout king, he's Lord and Savior. Give three women a high five, say baby, 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 get ready for the seventh day. On the seventh year, there's going to be a release. He said, In the seventh year, in other words, the seventh time, there's going to be a release. Shout seven times, release, release, release. Shout another seven times, release, 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 release. Release my wealth, release my trees, release my vineyard, release my shoes, baby. I want my milk and honey, I want my money. Release my destiny, release my building, release my soul, release my life. So Jericho, here I come, I don't fear. Too far to turn that back. There I come. The enemy doesn't know the strategy. Come on, go around Jericho once. The enemy thinks you're going home. That was yesterday. Behold, I do a new thing. I'm going round again. The enemy's wondering. What Jack up to now? Thinks you're going home. Tell your neighbor, it's not time to go home now. The violence are about to take it by force. I've been around three times. I did it six times. Once a day for six days. If I did it that time, I'm stronger now. I'm fitter now. My bones can handle it. I have muscle memory, so it's easy. I'm going round again. If somebody next to you is struggling, say, oh, my brother, can I help you go around? If two of you shall agree as touching anything, Come on, Marcus. I'll go round with you, baby. Make that money. Give them all the praise. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. Get ready for your miracle. Shout it's the Lord's release. Shout it's the Lord release. Amen. Devil, you owe and you owe big. It's the Lord's release. Amen. Watch me. It's now the seventh time. And as you go round the seventh time, Jericho has to give way. God promised I'm giving you Jericho. Jericho was given. God promised I'm giving you the king. The king was given. God promised I'm giving you the men of valor. The men of valor was given. But God had something sneaky up his sleeve. Amen. 
amen. When the walls came down and Jericho crumbled, God said, go to Harlot's house. Rahab is her name. Go and release Rahab. Rahab, your release has come. I know you have a bad rap on your life, but a release has come. I did all of this to destroy Jericho. We marched all this time to release Jericho to get you out. Because Rahab, you don't even know who you are. Yes, we're releasing you from this mayhem. We're taking you out of this horrible practice. But you don't even know why we are releasing you. Because inside of you is a Messiah who is Christ the Lord. We have to release you. Because if we release you, at some point, you will release the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So thank God for your trouble. Thank Him for your trials. Praise Him for your test. Because when the day of release comes, I'm coming out. Press down. Good measure. Shaken together. Run it over. My fruit will be abundant and it will remain. The devil is a liar. It's the Lord's release. Release my blessings. Release my anointing. Release my destiny. Release my power. Release my miracle. Leave my marriage alone. Take your hands off my children. I make a demand that this week, in the next 10 days, a massive release is coming. Release! 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 Give five people a high five. Say release! 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 Next week, this time, release! had nothing to eat they said if we sit here we're going to die let's go to the enemy's camp shout release Naaman release just seven times release shout release give your neighbor a high five say neighbor say neighbor It's your release. God said, God said, release. Celebrate the release in your life. The heathen have said, the Lord has done great things for them. And we will say, the Lord has done great things for us. Because he turns our captivity. Shout release. Give him a praise.
believer. Proclaim the release of the Lord on your life. Between now and Rosh Hashanah, when the trumpets are blown and the gates of judgment are open, rulings on your behalf are going to be granted. Adversaries are going to be avenged. Back payments and settlements are coming. It is the Lord's release. And if that enemy won't release it, a few days from Rosh Hashanah is Yom Kippur, the Feast of Atonement. They will pay a double price for not paying you. Right. Amen. This is the Lord's release. Say yes. Say yes. Raise the hand you're holding. I want to lead you. Just a guideline. This is just a guideline. God owns everything. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, the cattle, the fowls. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Everything belongs to me. Everything belongs to God. There's one thing that God does not own. God does not own thanksgiving. He doesn't own it. That's why you have to give it. Amen. So I want you to give him thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Sing with me. I'm not a great singer. I'm not a singer, but just bear with me. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 Come on. Thank you.
for coming out tonight. Thank you to Bishop Gates, his phenomenal wife, family, and the leadership of this great church. Thank you for this church for being so faithful and showing up, showing out. May the Lord reward you with the Colts Super Bowl. Amen. Right? You don't want the Super Bowl? Okay, well, we'll send it back to Dallas then if you don't want it. Everybody with an offering, amen. Put an offering in your hand. An offering in your hand. So we'll see. This is the release seed. Can you put Psalm 126? I think it's verse 5. He that goeth forth weeping. Thank you, seed. Amen. Our able team is going to sing. Amen. Authored by the late great Walter Hawkins. Amen. And you're just going to say thank you. Slipping away, the kind of miss down can get in the pain. But as for me, all I can say is thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa. Without homes, living out in the streets, with drug habits, some say they just can't be. Mothers and robbers, no place seem to be. They often on the altar. You've been my protection.
as we rise to our feet. Thank you. 